Hello. I'm John Patrick Higgins. And these are my strange stories. Why not relax, kick off your shoes, and enjoy the peculiar worlds inside my head. Inside John Patrick Higgins. A giant undertaking. He was the horizon. Behind the pink haze of his profile the sun was setting, fat and pale, sending cherry-coloured ribbons rippling through the sky. His back was the blue of the ground beneath him, the shadows thickening his body so that he seemed to be spreading into the earth. The top of him, pink and gold, butter-smeared in the molten sky, appeared smoothed off, excepting the purple hollows of his eyes. His hands were white, blind things, pushing into the ground, trying hard to return to it. He had always kept to himself, limiting his contact with the rest of the world. He stayed in his own places, the places where he could hide. But he had surrendered himself in death. I am no longer my own responsibility, he seemed to say. I am your problem now. We'll have to do something, said Councillor Frame. It's a bloody eyesore. And there are health implications, proffered Mr Coyle, the chemist. I mean, it's just not sanitary. There are going to be animals when it starts to break down. The entire council session shivered. The town had called for a crisis meeting as soon as they had realised what had happened. The giant, who in life had been so discreet, was proving difficult to ignore in death. Not to mention the smell, said Mrs Polly, her hand pressed to her collarbone, her large eyes closed as though already assailed by miasma. Terry Huntley placed his large hand over her free one in a comforting gesture. His wedding ring caught the sunlight, flashing madly. He withdrew his hand as quickly as he could, as casually as was decent. Ted Cavendish coughed. It was a quiet cough, an understated cough, a cough that was used to getting its own way. All eyes were on Ted. It would seem to me, he purred, it would seem to me that we have... A problem. Ted Cavendish owned half the town and half the countryside the town sat in. He owned factories and supermarkets. He owned two of the pubs and funded the secondary school, so he could be forgiven for stating the obvious. He also owned a cat's meat canning factory, so when he spoke at this particular meeting, there was an added frisson of excitement. Our giant friend appears to have popped his clogs on the hillside outside of town. This remark was directed to Dr Craven, nudging him gently from his silence. Um, yes, while the giant's physiognomy is largely the same as our own. And you do mean largely, said Ted, laughing at his own joke. Um, yes, I have been able to ascertain beyond reasonable doubt and with the aid of the fire brigade that the giant had, in fact, passed. Again, it's difficult to gain accurate information, but he does seem to be without a pulse and it's likely that rigor mortis has set in and uh, initial post-mortem decay has begun. Mrs Polly let out an involuntary gasp. Terry Huntley's hand stayed under the table. I see said Ted Cavendish. Well, clearly something needs to be done. It'll be worse than a landfill in a couple of weeks. There'll be seagulls, rats and more flies than a biblical plague. Why on earth did he have to plonk himself down outside the town? Why couldn't he have stayed wherever it is he lives? Why just deliver himself to us? I think we might need to call in the military. We can't deal with something like this on our own. There were murmurs of assent. 
I'm not sure how we'll even shift the thing. Ray, have you got any ideas? You're the closest thing we have to an expert here. Raymond Cox of Cox and Underwood Funeral Directors looked grave, as if to underline the nature of his profession. His long, thin face ended abruptly in a disappointing chin, forever in the shadow of his beaky nose. His eyes, a solemn and surprisingly sensual chocolate brown, were quite arresting. Raymond did all right with the ladies, especially for a man who smelled of embalming fluid. He used these imploring eyes now, mollifying a room full of pale, expectant faces. Of course, it's never easy, he said. Death is always hard to comprehend, especially a death as visible as our friends here. I think that on a purely practical level, we can cast aside a lot of the usual niceties. I don't think we need to worry about family considerations or religious sensitivities. The deceased had no extended family, I take it. There was a Mexican wave of non-committal shrugs around the council table. My understanding is that the deceased left no instructions in the event of his death. There was no will. You know there wasn't, said Ted, briskly. Quite so, said Raymond, folding and unfolding his long white fingers on the polished wooden table. Well then, I have just one final question. Do we want an open or closed casket? One or two of the council members looked at each other with sly, sideways glances. You can't seriously be thinking of burying the bugger, snorted Ted Cavendish. Of course, said Raymond. What else would you suggest? But it's the size of a bloody mountain. Think of the manpower. Think of the cost. Are you being ridiculous? What do you suggest? said Raymond, quietly. Ted Cavendish cleared his throat. We can get the army in. They can deal with it. Shift it. Use helicopters or something. Cut the bugger to pieces and ship him off somewhere. You want to cut him to pieces on the side of the hill, said Mrs Polly. In full view of the town, of the children. They could put a tarpaulin over it, said Ted. Cover it up. It'd be like an operation. There was a general unease at the notion of a post-mortem examination taking place on the hillside over town. Burn it, then, said Tim. Nay, palm it. We'll cremate the swine. You never know. It might have been what he would have wanted. I'm not sure I want half a mile of barbecue lighting up the horizon, Ted, said Councillor Frame. The smoke. And the smell. I'm a vegetarian, said Mrs Polly. And what if it's a good drying day, said Terry Huntley. My washing would be ruined. Ted Cavendish was becoming upset. He wasn't used to anything but feudal subservience from the locals and suddenly somebody had dropped a giant corpse on top of his town and his viable and practical solutions were being ignored. Well, we'll need to do something, he said. Or would you rather have a giant corpse rotting on the hillside? What's that going to do for your washing, Terry? Terry flushed violently. Beneath the table, Mrs Polly's hand met and squeezed his thigh. Twice. Maybe, continued Ted, maybe the army won't need to cut him up. They could just airlift him safely away. It's only forty or so miles to the sea. We could sink him, give the fish a treat. Um, I'm sorry, Ted, said Dr Craven. I wouldn't advise it. Uh, I couldn't guarantee the integrity of the body. The last thing you want is a rotten leg dropping off in the middle of the town square. It's true, Ted, said Councillor Frame. That one-way system is terribly compromised as it is. Right then, said Ted. I've given you useful options and you poo pooed them all. If anyone has any better ideas, I would love to hear them. I suggest, said Raymond Cox, that we bury him on the hillside where he chose to die. We bury him in a coffin with a marker for his head, the same as we would for anyone else. Why? said Ted. Because it's the right thing to do, Ted, said Raymond, simply. It's a bloody giant, said Ted. How long's it lived out there in the woods, the mountains, and what's it ever done for us? When my grandparents were building this town, did it help? It did nothing. 
and we owe it nothing. Nobody here has even spoken to it. We've had nothing to do with it when it was alive. Does anyone here even know its name? The assembly concluded that nobody knew the giant's name, or even if he had a name. That does present us with something of a problem, said Councillor Frame. At last, said Ted. What do we write on a headstone? I don't believe it, said Ted. How about a good friend, said Terry Huntley, earning another thigh squeeze from Mrs Polly. But he wasn't anyone's friend, thundered Ted. Nobody knew him. He wanted nothing to do with any of us. If he wasn't 400 feet tall, you'd never have known he was there. Now, I have a cat's meat factory. At the end of his life, he came to us, Ted. He came to us to die. He needed us then. The very least we can do is to bury him. Ted Cavendish's chair scraped back across the council chamber floor. He rose slowly to his feet, his knees cracking like a report of rifle fire inside his chunky mustard corduroys. His face was unappetizingly pitched between aubergine and liver. If you bury that thing, he said, you'll pay for it yourselves. You'll not see penny one from me. Of that, I can assure you. And with that, he picked up his hat and stormed from the room. And he was as good as his word, while the rest of the town set about a construction and excavation project that would have flummoxed a pharaoh, Ted looked on from his big house on the hill. And it was hard for the townspeople. There were rats and there were flies. The body had to be wrapped in an enormous tarpaulin and trussed tightly, so the army had to be called in to winch the giant body with helicopters. Putrefaction had set in, as Dr Craven had suggested, and the body was beginning to break down. The stench was appalling. The schools had to be closed for a number of weeks because of the threat of airborne toxic hazard and Terry Huntley dried his laundry in the laundrette in the next town. In his big house, Ted Cavendish looked down on all this and laughed. Councillor Frame broke his foot, digging the giant's grave, and Messrs Cokes and Underwood nearly lost their business, owing to Ray Cokes' hands-on approach to the construction of the world's largest coffin. Clive Underwood, very much the sleeping partner, slept through the whole thing. The one-way system was choked with shivering, smoking lorries carrying away the levelled hillside, and outside Trey began to avoid the town centre, as it was unsanitary and the traffic was a nightmare. Finally, after some three months of furious, disgusting enterprise, and with a short, non-denominational service, a fleet of forklifts pushed the trussed-up body into the giant grave, and the process of refilling the hole began. In fact, the grave proved to be rather too shallow, and the giant's nose poked out of the earth like a pink teepee. More earth was found, and a smaller, man-made hill was constructed. The stone was laid on top of it by an exhausted councillor frame, and everybody went to the pub. Ted Cavendish, beaming and clean, was waiting for them. He had forsaken his usual car scale for a bottle of Tattinger, which he was enjoying on his own. Congratulations, he said, his pink cheeks gleaming. Thank you, Ted, said Ray Cox. How's business? Couldn't be better, thanks for asking, said Ted. Who would have thought that not taking three months off work to dig a bloody big pit would turn out to be a canny business move? What about you, Ray? How's the funeral business? You should hang around Councillor Frame. He looks like he might be ready to drop. Oh, you know, Ted, said Ray. Soon be right back on top. 
He headed for the bar for a drink. To the giant, said Ted, raising his glass. He crippled you, killed your businesses, he destroyed the town, and he stank the place out. To a good friend. He threw his head back and drained his glass in one, smacking his lips and looking around, grinning. Terry Huntley raised his glass. A good friend, he said. And one by one, the townsfolk raised their glasses, murmured a toast, and drank long, well-deserved draughts. Ted's grin evaporated like champagne bubbles. The townspeople were turning their backs on him, chatting amongst themselves. They were relaxed and intimate, easy in each other's company. And there was another thing, a new thing, an electric sense of excitement, a quiet elation. For the first time there was a buzz about the town. Ted saw, to his dismay, that though dishevelled and sore, the townspeople seemed happy. They had joined together in the reckless pursuit of folly and they had seen it through to the end. They had an indomitable sense of being able to do anything together. They had become something larger than themselves. They had knitted together, like a healing body. You morons! shouted Ted. That giant has buried you and you're happy about it. Why? Raymond Cokes pressed past him. Because it was the right thing to do, Ted. Inside John Patrick Higgins was brought to you by the colour blue and the letter G. Written and performed by John Patrick Higgins, it was produced and edited by Graham Watson.